Welcome to Seniority Authority, the podcast where I track down experts to answer your questions on aging. I'm your host, Kathleen Toomey. Let's get smarter about growing older. There's a wonderful quote from the poet Mary Oliver you might be familiar with, which is, what are you going to do with your one wild and precious life? That's a great jumping off point to think about the future, especially if you're thinking about retirement. To me, this feels more generative and exciting, and it certainly describes the point of view of our next guest, author Andrew Robin. At age 68, Andy stepped away from his tech career and began what he called a tapas life that offers a new way of thinking about your next chapter, or as he refers to it, when your long career period is ending and a new one is beginning. Thanks to our show sponsor, The Riverwoods Group, Northern New England's largest family of not-for-profit continuing care retirement communities, where independent, active adults find purpose, community, and peace of mind. Visit us at riverwoodsgroup.org. Now, let's hear from today's guest. Andy, welcome to Seniority Authority. Why, thank you, Kathleen. I'm so thrilled to have you here. Another podcast guest, Joe Casey, told me about your book, which I love, which is called Tapas Life. And the link to your book is in our show notes. But one of the things I really love about the book is that it takes the reader through the process of how to think about their life differently. And it's exactly what you did in your life. True that. I mean, uh, I took four and a half years to go through this process myself, and then I decided to write about it to try to be useful to someone else as a step-by-step guide. Well, I would highly recommend to our readers, to to our listeners, to pick it up because it is a very practical step-by-step chapter book. And right off the bat, you talk about the trepidation of unstructured time. And you call it the white rabbit in the snowstorm phenomena. So explain that phenomena and what you suggest people do about that. Okay. So, of course, a white rabbit in a snowstorm is uh, kind of a big white sheet. There's not much there. And that's what people's calendar often looks like after they leave their long career. And the word I use for that is you quickly become untethered. You become adrift, and it's easy to start, you know, wondering, well, what am I going to do? And it it may be that after you leave your long career, you've got all kinds of things you want to do. You may be traveling. You may be uh, playing some sports, doing art things, and, and that's great, and you do that for a while, and then one day you wake up, and it doesn't seem to be any motivation to get out of bed. And yeah. that's that's when you need some structure, Kathleen. You need to start putting a few things in your life that make it feel like it has some cadence to it. So, you know, whether you take the garbage out on Thursday night, whether you read some email or news in the morning, you know, what your breakfast routine is, whether you do some exercise certain times of the week or certain days of the week, you have to start putting in something. I think that's great advice because I do think that is one thing that people held themselves back because they go from super scheduled to no scheduled and they start losing sense of their own agency, their own ability to structure their world. So the idea that we do all need some form of structure and to start laying that down as your first kind of base layer of how you live your life is a really good idea, very practical. And I also think that what happens to a lot of the people that are listening to this podcast and a lot of people who have been working in the same field, doing the same thing for so long, they're really good at it, but then they are not doing it anymore and they're told, do what you love. I think a lot of people get stuck 
because they are stuck <laughs> in what used to be and they're they don't even know how do I figure out what I love. I've been, you know, an accountant for 40 years or I've been a teacher for 45 years and what do I love? I don't even know. What's your recommendation for people to get unstuck? So I really have three chapters that address that. I suppose the easiest one for many people is called keeping your business brain alive. And so whatever you did in your career, reapply it in a different way. Okay, so be a mentor, be a teacher, do a gig, do a project, consult, become a speaker on the topic, help kids in some way. So use what you have developed over those decades in a different way. So that's one thing you can do. Another chapter I have is about making meaning. And this is a stage of life when you really need to find some meaning because it's no longer about raising a family or having a career or both. And usually that means doing something selflessly for someone else. So volunteer to do something. Join a volunteer group. Do something at your place of worship or in some community organization or in an ad hoc fashion. Go work in a soup kitchen. Mm -hmm. Whatever. And the third thing is just to find something you love, which was the first thing you mentioned. And yeah, I find it astonishing, but it probably shouldn't be. It should be surprising that a lot of people have lost touch with what they love. And so I ask you, well, what did you love doing as a teenager or when you were in college, if you went to college, when you were a younger person before your long career? Is that of interest to you? Do you have some friends with things in their life that you've always kind of looked at lovingly and said, wow, I'd love to be doing that. Try it. One of the great things of this time of life is that you can try things and fail miserably, like I discuss in my chapter, Fail Freely. Yes. And there's no cost. All you get to do is mine it for learning. Say, well, I found out I do like this and I don't like that. And that will help inform me as to my next top of selection. Exactly. Exactly. So using those markers as a way to get unstuck is a really good way to think about it. You also identified that there are two types of thinkers. Uh, you discuss them in your book, convergent and divergent thinkers. And based on your own personality and profile and style, you may be one or the other. Can you describe for our listeners the difference between convergent and divergent thinkers? Yeah, convergent people are folks who gather a little bit of data and then they rapidly come to some sort of decision and action, if action's to be taken. And uh, divergent thinkers uh, gather a bit of data and then that informs them on what other data might need to be collected. And they can continue out into bushy growth of all the data they collect and aren't necessarily very big on making quick decisions. Now, of course, both of those types of people are sorely needed in the world, but you have to then do stuff that works for you, right? So if you're going to be an options trader on the floor in uh, Chicago, you better be pretty convergent because you got to make a lot of snap decisions right quick. And uh, if you're going to be a research scientist, you better be a divergent thinker because you need to keep understanding more and more different aspects of the problem that you're researching and see how it ties to other things. So if you're at the end of your long career and trying to develop a further life, some convergent thinkers might have a hard time deciding because the data doesn't really inform them the way it did in their long career. And they might get a little bit of analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. And the thing to do with that is, just for God's sake, pick something. Get started <laughs> on it. There's no cost. 
try it. You may like it. You may like parts of it. You yeah, don't like that, it? Go on to something else. I love that. And that really dives into the mindset of a tapas life. So describe for our listeners how you came up with this term, which I think is so perfect, and how you identify a tapas life. Uh, so for your listeners who aren't uh, don't know it, tapas is, uh, it actually literally means covers in Spanish. And it relates to the Spanish food, which you go to a tapas bar in Spain, and instead of ordering uh, an appetizer and an entree, you order little tiny plates. They're about the size of a coffee saucer. And they bring you some little tiny dish. And they bring you lots of other little tiny dishes as you order them, and maybe some wine, a vinillo. And eventually it sort of covers the table, and hence the name tapas. Uh -huh. So I relate my long career to more of a 64-ounce uh, porterhouse steak <laughs> that filled up the entire plate and hung over the edges and didn't leave room for a lot else. Yeah, that's a great analogy, like the Flintstones kind of steak. <laughs> yeah, the Flintstones kind of steak. Yeah, I could just picture hanging on to that big, huge bone I'm chewing on. And uh, that's what life was like in those decades of uh, career and family. And then with the tapas life, you really get to assemble. You get to say, well, I'll try this. If I liked it, maybe I'll do a little bit more of it. If I liked some aspects of it, maybe I'll look for some other things that have the aspects I liked more. And then you add something else. And these things can all be added or dropped or edited at any moment. You don't have any big commitments to any of them. Of course, if you decide to join, say, a social organization and become the uh, executive vice president of it, and then you say, ah, I'm tired of this, and bail out, well, you know, that may not be a nice thing to do, but most of these tapas, you just let go of any time you want and try something else that looks tastier or juicier. And one of the things I recommend in my book is a website called the VIA Happiness Survey. And VIA stands for Values in Action, which come from a guy named Martin Seligman, who has written a lot about happiness. A Fantastic researcher, at, uh, researcher and writer at UPenn, and you know, it's a survey you take. It's super annoying for 45 minutes because it says, well, would you pick this or this? And you hate both of them, or you love both of them. You have to pick one. And at the end, it gives you in rank order what they call your character strengths and what I call the things that give you juice, the things that feed you. And then when you're looking for a tapa, you use that as a sieve. Mm-hmm. You say, oh, does this tapa seem like it's going to give me some of these top three or four or five things in my rank ordering? Yeah, good. I think I'll try it. If it doesn't feel like it's going to give me those, then I might ask myself, I wonder why I was looking at it. Did I think I should? Well, don't do stuff that you think you should. Do stuff that you want to, and that will give you a more complete life at this stage of your life. I love trading shoulds for could. Yeah. You don't, you, just because you feel like you should do it is not the good reason, right. but you could do it. It would be something new. And I love that via character study, and we will put a link in our show notes that you mentioned that's backed by research and Martin Seligman's work, because it does give you some insight to yourself. And I think when you enter this period after your long career, you have the ability to reinvent and get a little deeper into yourself and your sense of purpose than you did when you were in a career to make your money and raise your family and keep a roof over your head and all of the things that we have to do. Now you have a little more agency, a little more choice in your life. And it's a good way to kind of check in with your essential self. 
what is my essential self? What's responding to that? And everyone's always fascinated to learn more about themselves, right? So who is not fascinated by their own self? Our, <laughs> so, uh, our favorite topic, right? Our favorite topic. <laughs> Tell me more. Tell me more about myself. <laughs> so doing that character survey can help you also get unstuck. If you are saying, I've been in a chemical engineer for so long, I don't really know what I love anymore. That can help provide a frame of reference or a sieve, as you say, for the different tapas. And then the mindset, let's talk about the tapas mindset, that it's not, you're not in here to grind out 40 years in this enterprise or in this experiment. You're there to, as you said, have a little taste. So can you talk a little bit more about the concept of failing fully that you describe in your book? What are you choosing the tapas for? Uh, sure. And I'll just say on passant that, yeah, the tapas are for tasting, but you can also keep some and just keep chewing on them because they're so delicious. Mm -hmm. Like Keep uh, ordering more of the same thing. Yes. Classical piano is one of my anchor tapas. Okay. And doing some life coaching and a little bit of executive coaching is one of my anchor tapas. Although I cap my practice at five clients because it's a tapa, not mm -hmm. a new career. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can have some that continue on and some that come and go. You know what I also think, Andy, is that a lot of people go from being the head of an organization, like I'm a, a VP of something or a CEO of something. And then they go immediately into, I'm going to lead the board. I'm going to be a CEO of a volunteer sure, board, or I'm sure, going to run that. Sure. And you don't, you can play with how you identify yourself. Going from one leadership position that you were paid money to another leadership position that you're not paid money, it's not much of a change, really. It's not. You're at a time of life when you can explore a fuller you. And there, I have the back part of the book is all about that. And so, I mean, it starts if you have a life partner with figuring out what that relationship is now. Because it's not what it was when you were dating. It's not what it was when you got together. It's not what it was while you were raising a family, if you did. And it's not what it was while you were in your long career. You know, now you're both at home. And like the old joke says, my wife told me I was uh, welcome to hang around the house all I want as long as I don't come in. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a version of that. that I married you forever, but not for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so... You know, I have a chapter on rediscovering that relationship, which is of key importance because a lot of marriages dissolve at this stage when people look at each other and realize that they're cheek by chowl instead of cheek by cheek. Mm -hmm. And instead, you can reinvent. And I have some questions and some websites I point people at where you can start having some conversations over months and figure out what do we still have in common? What do we like? What do we want our life to be like? going forward. So there's that. I have a, a section on uh, letting go of your defense mechanisms of your youth, a book by a guy named Hollis, Finding Meaning in the Second Half of Life. And I have an older brother, six years older than I am, and he was pretty mean to me as I was a kid. And he would always tell me how stupid I was by you know, giving me an algebra problem when he was in ninth grade and I was in third. And he'd <laughs> say, boy, are you stupid. And uh -huh. so for my whole life until my mid-50s, when I went to coaching school, you know, somebody would say, uh, hey, Andy, you better close the door so the cold air doesn't get in. I, I, my response was, I'm not stupid. Of mm -hmm. course, I'll close the door. Mm-hmm. And then I finally learned to let go of that in my mid-50s. That's so pretty good. It's an opportunity at this age because we all have those defense mechanisms we put in place to grow up in the family we grew up in. And guess what? Most of them probably don't serve us worth a damn any. And so there's an opportunity to go back and decide to let go of those or modify how they work. 
or at the very least become aware of them. If you're getting smarter, let us know. Leave us a review, a rating, wherever you listen to podcasts. Tell your friends and follow us on social. We're at Seniority Authority on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. And don't forget, if you're listening to YouTube, hit the notification bell so you can subscribe. Or subscribe to our newsletter at SeniorityAuthority.org so you don't miss a thing. You just landed on becoming aware of them and understanding what is automatic and why it is automatic and can you change that behavior, which is hard work if it's baked into you for 50, 60 years. It's hard work. It took me a number of years to finally defeat that one. But this is all the this back half of the book or back part of the book that's about being instead of doing. Mm -hmm. So we spend our whole life doing and proving competence. Can I hold my head up? Can I crawl? Can I stand, walk, eat, toilet train, get through school, find a life? Can I do all that? Can I get ahead? Maybe make more money? All these metrics that we're constantly trying to beat. And at this stage of life, there's an opportunity to pay attention to how we show up. And so it's the spousal relationship. It's the letting go of old mental models and ways of being that aren't serving us anymore. It's finding our flow activity, the thing at which we can sit down and be at it for three or four hours, and it felt like 10 minutes. It wasn't necessarily fun per se, but it deeply used us in our entirety, and so it's deeply rewarding finding that. And then it's things like doing meaningful work, and it's things like uh, going up Maslow's hierarchy of needs and working on Mm self-actualization. It's deciding to be kinder to others. It's learning more about how to be in challenging conversations with an open mind instead of an an aggressive reaction. There's many opportunities to be better and more fully as a human. And it's exciting because this is a new chapter you can embark on free of some of the burdens of the need to, as you say, provide for those lower levels of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So you've gotten to where you've gotten and you have some resources and a lot of time and the door's wide open. I'm curious, when you talk to people about the tapas life, are they curious or are people curious about this topic and do they want to learn more? So everybody loves the title. Everybody loves the idea and they quickly want to know more. And people ask me, how did you come up with that anyway? And like I said, I went through a four and a half year process and probably three and a half or four years into it, I ran into a friend on the street who asked me, hey, Andy, what have you been up to? And uh, I said, I'm living my tapas life. It just dropped out of my brain like a gumball, out of a gumball <laughs> machine, you know? And, uh, Oh, yeah. Only after three and a half years of working on it. And then it dropped out like a gumball. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, people are very intrigued by it. And because it's a different way. And, you know, obviously, it's not for everybody. There are the people who will find a second large career. There are the second people who will go climb mountains in Tibet. Mm hmm and uh, find the uh, learned gurus. And there are the people who look like the what I consider fabulously stupid retirement ads of the couples uh, sitting watching the grass grow. Mm -hmm. Because the fact is, you said this isn't like the 40 years of grinding out a career, but it could easily be the 30 or 35 years of figuring out a life after your long career. Oh, sure. Retirement is totally different now. It's 20 plus years. And when you after 65, 
we're all going to be living to at least 85 or longer. I mean, all generally speaking, because yeah. longevity is the best it's ever been. So that gives us an opportunity and it's time for people to stop denigrating the fact of getting older and start celebrating it and seeing what you can do with your life. What can you still do? And that's why I love this concept because it is generative and it is, it's experimental and it gives you opportunities to try things and fail and try different things. It's just this freedom and the lack of expectation that the next thing you're going to get into is what is going to serve you for the next 20 years. So I just love this or mindset. More. Or more, or more. <laughs> so if my listeners are interested in starting a Tapas Life, are there some hard and fast rules that you would advise or guidelines, not rules, as to how many Tapas or too many Tapas? You know, is Are there kind of like, you know, those blow up bumpers you put on when you're bowling. Are there bumpers? Are you there guidelines you <laughs> recommend so that people don't overdo it uh, when they jump into this idea? <laughs> no, but it's okay to bounce off the walls. It's all right. <laughs> it's different, right? The only thing I would encourage people to maybe not do is, first of all, when you leave your long career, give yourself time to decompress. Don't jump into a bunch of stuff. Do your travel. Do do the stuff that you've been wanting to do. As I talk about in the book, make sure you do have a financial plan and do have your legal documents in order, durable power of attorney for health care, stuff like that. Do make sure you understand your finances so you don't wind up in trouble on that. Do put in some structure. But yes, decompress. Mm-hmm. Take the time you need. For me, it was 18 months of decompression before I said, I've got some energy to start something. And that's when I started taking piano lessons that I had always wanted to do. Wow. Beyond that, leave yourself some blank space. Let Mm -hmm. your brain sit. You know, go for a walk in nature. Don't fill your calendar up from dawn to dusk because... You can leave some blank space and allow things to emerge. Mm-hmm. Call a you know a work friend or an old friend or somebody you know from somewhere and say, hey, you want to go to lunch this week? Get out of the house and see some other humans. Social connection is so important. So leave yourself room for all that. And if after a while you do add more and more tapas or some of your tapas get larger and it feels like too much, then jettison something Mm -hmm. or trim it back. Yeah. Because you can. Yeah. You know, I tried a half-time gig after a while thinking, well, you know, keep my business brain alive. And... Boy, after three, four months of a try-by on this gig working in the solar industry, which was vaguely related to the technology I enjoyed my career with, and I was like, this is way too much of an invasion on my tapas life. Good. And I jettisoned it. And I never took on anything half-time nor close to it again, because I had learned I like this spaciousness. And I'm not giving it up. That's a wonderful word to apply to your life, spaciousness. Yeah. And that allows you, as you said, and as you write in the later chapters, to explore and focus on who you are, how to be as a person. You need a little time and space to do that, or you're not always doing it. In our culture, we are focused on doing, doing, doing. And we honor the busyness. We think busyness is fabulous. And that is such a false God, I think. So I love the fact that you're talking about this. I so appreciate all the wisdom and the wisdom in the book. And I highly recommend to the listeners uh, to go out and get this book. It's quick. It's 
practical and it's a good guide to just have so that it's like a lifeline, like, okay, I could figure this out and here's my lifeline to help me get on the right path. Um, is there Thank anything? You for that, Kathleen. Oh, you're welcome. And, and I would note that it's really kind of a handbook. So yes. Not, you can sit down and read it in probably half an hour or an hour. I wrote it very conversationally. It's an easy read, but it's good to come back to chapters and use them as a reference. Oh, yeah. I referenced and underlined certain chapters and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to come back to this. I want to know that when I go to think about doing this, there is a reference point, you know, and I'm definitely going to be using this and recommending this. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would want to share with our listeners about your experience, your your wisdom that you've shared so beautifully with us today? Well, I'll share something uh, personal that's been a challenge for me. When I left the work world, because my wife wanted to go back to work, we decided before we got married that we each wanted our career and each wanted to be at-home caregivers of our kids. She had them when they were small, and I had them before they went to college. And everybody won. And then, you know, eventually I assembled this tapas life and have been living it. I'd say after about 16 years of the tapas life, I really did assemble that a little bit earlier than you referenced. I had sort of done everything that I wanted to. And so I have my anchor tenants of coaching and piano and cooking and wine and stuff like that. But my wife and I have done a ton of world travel, didn't, didn't want any more of that especially. Rather travel a bit more in the U.S. if we have time. And I found myself just kind of looking at my hands saying, well, what now? And so now I've been going through another longish period of what now? Because I'm 70. I expect to be around for another 20 years anyway. Mm -hmm. Sure. And now I'm having to reinvent again. And so, I mean, by sheer dint of dumb luck, I wound up on a nonprofit board. And some years later, the president died and, and left word that I was to follow up as president. And so now I find myself as board president of a nonprofit that gives away about four and a half million dollars a year to very needy causes like hunger and homelessness. And, you know, it's a great meaningful thing to add to my life. I wouldn't have planned on it. I had the spaciousness to allow it in. I still have a lot of empty time on my calendar and I'm still busy reinventing, but I'm I'm open to stuff, and that, I think, is if you're in good health and keep yourself in good health, you eat well, you do a little exercise, you don't have to be in the Olympics, boy, you, you really could be around for 30 years, and that's a long time when there's no agenda. You're absolutely right, and as you're talking, I'm thinking about, you know, there's been so much writing recently about the multiple generations in the workforce and a lot of conversation about millennials and Gen Xers and how people who are younger have multiple careers, not multiple jobs, but multiple careers. And yep. just reframing this, it seems like you're thinking and acting like a millennial and that you're saying, I have different careers, I have different opportunities, I have different... And it's a youthful mindset, and it's a mindset that is very positive about the years that we have. And if there's one thing that I am hoping that our listeners hear in this space, in this place, is that aging is a gift that we should appreciate because not everyone has the opportunity to age, and you should be grateful for it and enjoy everything that you can do and focus on what you can do, not what you can't or couldn't, can't do like you did when you were 20 or it's just, it's, as you said, it doesn't serve you to focus on what you can't do. 
focus yeah, on what you can do. I, I saw a great bumper sticker the other day. It says, old age is not a disease. It's a triumph. Yes, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Okay, we are going to get into our lightning round. Okay. So we already know you have a great tapas life, and now we're going to get to know you a little bit better. Right. So share with our listeners, what is your favorite guilty pleasure? My favorite guilty pleasure, I suppose, is my wonderful glass of red wine in the evening from my wine cellar that I've been curating for 30 years, and now I get to sit around and drink 20-year-old Bordeaux. Oh, that sounds really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and it's red wine, so it's actually not that guilty. It's a good thing for you. <laughs> of all the healthy things that you do, what is your favorite healthy practice, Andy? Oh, I really like biking. I live in San Francisco, and I love biking along the Embarcadero and biking out to Golden Gate Park and biking down into the Mission District. It's uh, wonderful. It's so nice that San Francisco is so flat, too. Uh, I, I biking do have an, is challenging there. <laughs> I do have an eight speed, and I do still do all the hills myself. Wow. And, and yes, there are some hills that I will not broach. And everybody I know keeps telling me to get an electric assist bike. And I'm like, no, this is my cardio, and I'm going to keep That's it. That's impressive. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what is guaranteed to make you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this will sound stupid, but but I am. My brain comes up with all manner of stupid puns and stupid humor all day long. And I probably self-censor 99% of it out. You say and, that in the book, that you're a pun fiend. <laughs> oh, I am a pun fiend. But uh, also, my wife and I like to end the day with some half-hour comedy show. For a while, we were on Seinfeld, and now we're on Frasier. And oh. we both sit there and laugh and have a great time. That is so fantastic and a very healthy thing to do better than watching the news, um, especially on TV. What tell us what the last book was that you loved? It's actually a book I'm currently reading. It's Kissinger's latest book. It's profiles of six uh, world leaders that he knew for decades. And he goes into their history, how they formed his relationship and involvement with them. And it's wow. uh, quite fascinating because who has had the experience he did? And I guess he has his team of writers. And at 99, to come out with this book is uh, another example of why you're not dead when you're 65. Exactly. That's impressive. Wow. Okay, your favorite escape. You've traveled all over the world, you and your wife. What's your favorite getaway? Well, it's not exactly a getaway. Uh, Carol and I like to go places where we spend some time, where we get to know the place a little bit better. And so we love Paris, and we have now three different times, several years apart each time. Uh, we've rented a, a VRBO or an apartment in, in Paris for a month and just gone and lived there like the locals. And it's like San Francisco. You can walk everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, seven miles, or eight miles side to side. We have some days walked the 14 miles from the left bank to Saint-Denis to check that place out and we walk every place and and we live like locals and I'm self-taught at a little bit of French from doing that in online courses and I'm fluent in Spanish as is my wife and so we can read everything there and we can speak enough that they understand us and then when they were when they answer we're, we're out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> as a google translate is for <laughs> but it's so oh, wonderful that sounds so like wonderful a great escape and a great way to practice having some spaciousness in your life to just Truth. wander around paris a flaneur being a flaneur just walking exactly. through the neighborhoods exactly 
Thank you so much, Andy. You've given us so much to think about, a great guide for how to think differently about your next chapter. And I would love to stay in touch and see what your next evolution is. Well, thank you very much, Kathleen. I appreciate your including me. That's our show for today. If it helped you think differently, will you help me? Go to the Seniority Authority page on your favorite podcasting app and hit either the plus heart sign, favorite, or subscribe button. And let more people know about this mission of ours. Until then, enjoy the chance to get smarter about growing older. That's our show for today. If you liked it, please tell your friends so we can reach more minds and keep the conversation going. Or follow us on social at Seniority Authority. I'm Kathleen Toomey. Until next time, enjoy your chance to get smarter about growing older. Mm -hmm.